Blog Talk Radio. listeners, and thank you for taking the time to listen to Dark Matters Radio. I am the Sorceress Cagliastro, Blood Sorceress, Necromancer in the Hands of Nine, and I am honored to be on the air this evening on an ongoing basis with three individuals whose point of view is extraordinarily different from one another and whose moral compass it appears to be very similar. What a wonderful group of people to work with. First, I'd like to introduce Chris Rogostrowski, my co-host. How are you this evening, Chris? Oh, not bad. How are you doing, Sorcerers? Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, our um, science officer, as I like to refer to Morgan, and our producer, Morgan St. Knight. Good evening, Morgan. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, Sorcerers, as always. Thank you. And welcome, Victor, the voice Furman. How are you this evening after your travels Beautiful. this week? Wonderful, and I'm very happy to be back. I had a, a couple of days with business in Curacao, but I also had a wonderful discovery while in Curacao, which I'll share with you later. Excellent. Thank you. Tonight we're going to go for about an hour and a half, as I have uh, an appointment later this evening that requires immediate attention, and I thank the listeners for that flexibility. The subject for the evening is sigils and triggers. Um, this is, as usual, as it pertains to the Dark Matters radio show, not something that you hear elsewhere, um, not something discussed in this kind of format on a usual basis. Sigils and triggers. Well, in sorcery, and, and in the manner of sorcery that I work in, the science of sorcery, triggers are vital. And one of the ways that we talk about triggers is to um, intentionally sort of self-implant these these switches that can be flipped so that one can work in immediacy carrying one's sorcery with them everywhere, and working in real time when necessary or when desired. We're going to talk about triggers, and we're going to talk about them in and out of their pathway through sigils. And um, as always, Morgan will have some science on the subject tonight, but I want to talk just a little bit about sigils and, and what they are and what it comes from and all this sort of thing. So sigils are, um, if you look at them structurally, they are a group of shapes, Images, dots and dashes, things of this nature, often by the nature of the fact that they are used uh, as a contained self story are uh, they are regularly presented inside of a circle inside of um some sort of enclosure that's not absolutely mandatory, but that seems to be more often than not, and the symbols and the letters and the the dashes dots, all manner of this and that that go into sigils, each represent part of a larger picture. Sigils for healing, sigils for stopping intruders, sigils for exposing a thief, sigils for all manner of things. Go way back in uh, the history of, of sorcery, and I say the history of sorcery, by which I mean any time in the history of the human experience where one suggested a thought and therefore enacted on that thought by a manner other than um, stepping over and, and physically stepping into the situation by acting on a thought from a distance. Some people called it prayer. I call it sorcery. And this is what sigils come from. They come from the, the human desire to make an annotation and to have that annotation some, be something others can follow and um, have the, that be something that can serve, can serve them over and over. So on that note, any thoughts? I'm hearing a lot of static. Does somebody have a fan on? Hello? No, no I don't know what that is. I don't have is. a fan. Not me. Okay. Nope. Okay, just checking. There it goes. It's gone away. So um, you, does anybody want to jump in on that before we start to um, take it apart and look at the science? 
Well, what I've done in my practice, um, and this goes back to some of the basics when I first started, was uh, Norse mythology uh, and their use of runes. And, you know, runes are their, was their alphabet. And unlike our alphabet, they, each letter was empowered with something. Each one had its own energy, its own abilities, things like that. And they would combine these together, not just to make words and sentences and phrases. They would put them together to make um, like a talisman, if you will. Uh, you'd combine several of them, and you would make something that would grant prosperity or one for healing or one for protection or one for banishment or things like that. So this is something that I got accustomed to very early to using things like this. And it's a way for me to, I can make something and, like I say, just put it on a Post-it note and put it on my refrigerator. And I see it with my mind every day, whether I pay attention to it or not. And that thought is planted in my head. And that was my first exposure to using such a thing as a as a sigil. Well, Chris, to your point, the runes um, at this point in history still find themselves heavily represented in sigils. They are so powerful. They are so specific. And they have such a, an enormous story to tell, each and every one of them. Like you were saying, they are not necessarily an alphabet, as uh, only an alphabet. They are other things as well. They are. They represent energies. They represent entities. They represent ways of being, chaos, and this and this and that sort of thing. And um, there are many, many uses of them in sigils currently as well. If you look at the Galdabra and you compare that to some of the more current sigils things that I'm working on, things other people are working on. You can see those influences amongst people who even don't know the runes. They somehow have taken on an ability to become part of the the common consciousness, if you will. And um, they express themselves in many pieces, even more, more modern, newer pieces. So um, I absolutely agree with you. That is a very early start. The, the hieroglyphs as well. Um, hieroglyphs were pictographs, but they had that similar kind of essence about them that a small squiggle could mean something specific to a large consciousness of people, and that is really what sigils are for. And you'll see those things kind of combined as well in the um, in the formation and the alphabets, these kinds of letters. But let me not take up the whole time. Thoughts? Anybody? Well, I was going to say that uh, my first exposure to what are sigils, even though I did not know they were sigils at the time, was again with my grandfather, who was uh, an Orthodox Jew, who was a Kabbalist, and uh, who would show me talisman, including talisman containing the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, uh, and uh, told me, and and again, at a very young age, I was five and six and seven when I had these conversations with him about the power of these, and I didn't understand what he meant in those days, but Later on, as I grew in my studies and my knowledge, I had a, a definite understanding. Uh, my second exposure to sigils, in the more common sense of sigils, uh, was when I started studying with a mystery school about 15 years ago. And those were sigils that were based on the Enochian system of, uh, of D. Uh, and uh, they were used, again, as, uh, uh, I, I would say, energy holders within the context of the work of the mystery school. And it just dawned on me that um, the sigils that, uh, there are sigils that are out there that are in front of everyone every day, if I can go be so bold as to make the extrapolation to say that common signs that we all see every day, stop signs, um, direction signs, uh, uh, things that indicate certain rooms and areas, uh, are, are really symbolic sigils, uh, and they do implant a signal or a, or a trigger in your mind that when you see them, you react in a certain way. I agree with you, Victor. You mentioned a stop sign. We've talked about this. 
You don't read the word stop when you see this red symbol with white letters inside. You know that this means stop. It's, it becomes almost past automatic and autonomic in a way. Your foot hits the brake and or you stand in, on the corner and you look around. and it, it becomes ingrained in us, this method of communication, communicating what is necessary in that moment for all persons passing through that area. And you mm-hmm. you were talking about um, the the ta- aleph bets and the the Kabbalah symbols and uh, you mean talismans like the the seal of King Solomon or the flower of life the Merkabah exactly. these kinds of things yeah exactly well, the, yes, the Merkabah yes. is very interesting I mean if we want to talk for a minute about that one I don't know you you probably are familiar with that Victor the uh, absolutely the light yes the light chariot of the light body. Do you want to talk about that structure and what that looks like? It's a very interesting one, and and it's one that, if if I may add, that has even been flattened in terms of imagery. There's a way to draw it flat, and um, people use it in that way, too, without it being three-dimensional. Well, the three-dimensional image is like a pyramid within a pyramid um, Mm -hmm. with a a slice down the center, so to speak. I'm not good at describing things like that, but (laughs) is that pretty accurate, what I just said, a pyramid? Yeah, I would say so, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and the concept of the Merkaba is that it's the light body, the astral body, or the light plane, or the light ship, uh, a method of traveling uh, through, uh, through dimensions and time and space uh, based on uh, this concept of light. If you take it and flatten it, you actually get the Kabbalistic tree of life, uh, which mm-hmm. is another yeah. extrapolation of, of, the, of, the, of the Merkaba. Mm-hmm. So every culture has this experience, every single culture. I mean, if you look at the religious symbols, if you look at the cultural standard symbols of a, of a, a culture, you will see that that this concept of a drawing, a wordless drawing, if you will, has a, a, a trigger effect. And that this is something that has served humanity. And as sorcerers or practitioners of all the various things that the four of us do, the idea of um, extrapolating from that common usage and expanding and broadening the gaze is the usefulness of sigil work. I, I do quite a bit of this now with my students and um, with my clients as well. The interesting thing is clients who have no exposure to sorcery and come to me for a solution, which is what they all come for, they say that, well, what am I supposed to do with this drawing? And I say, well, draw it. Let's, let's start there. I've sent it to you, redraw it in your hand, redraw it five or six times and tell me what it, what happens. And, and of course, what the sigil is meant for is what they gain from it because it comes from data and looking at the experience of many people utilizing it. Um, but, but the important thing with that kind of work is I don't necessarily tell them what the intention is unless we're working at the level where they're starting to learn and understand sorcery. Um, but these things are profound, and they have a scientific aspect because our brain is taking in this information without its associated data, without saying this is used for this. We're going to do a thing in, in the sigil lab, which is one of the rooms in a space that I'm developing, and um, the point of it is for people to come and just put their hands over the sigils and see which ones jump out at them, see which ones make an impression upon them and you can figure out where they can utilize those sigils in their life. So we're going from the other direction. We're letting the very language of the sigil speak to the individual and call out to them. Does anyone else hear that noise? It sounds like either a subway yeah. car coming through or a bowling ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sitting in a quiet room with an occasional dog barking, so it's not me. I, I am too. I'm by, sitting by here with a cat. Up, up, up. I'm Morgan, sorry, go ahead. Well, Morgan, what were you going to say about the? Uh, bring us a little bit in, maybe not all the way in, but a little bit into the science of the thing, and we'll take it apart. Okay, sure. Uh, I apologize. I've been having some technical difficulties, so I've missed part of the show. But uh, I did want to point in out that um, there's a lot of science behind triggers and how they affect the human brain. And it, until very recently, it was kind of a hazy science. People didn't really understand exactly how memory worked and how impressions were made in the brain and why we could sometimes remember things and why we couldn't always remember things. 
But a couple of years ago, researchers at MIT were able to actually pinpoint in laboratory mice the areas of the brain that were activated when long-term memories were actually being formed and stored. And this is through a process known as engrams. Now, engrams had been theorized uh, since the early 1900s by neurophysicists, but no one has succeeded in actually isolating the part of the brain in which these engrams supposedly took place. But it turns out that the scientists at MIT found out that cell clusters within the hippocampus were actually forming strong bonds and uh, every time a significant event took place for the mouse, and they were actually able to uh, do an experiment in which they exposed a mouse to fear in a maze situation by giving it a mild shock. And then uh, at the same time, they were able to manipulate the mouse's brain in such a way that that exact cluster of cells that activated when that memory formed became sensitive to light stimulation. So when they were using optical light impulses, the mouse once again reacted as if it had been shocked. It, it hunkered down into a frozen, fear-like position, but no shock had been given. And this essentially means that the mouse was reliving the experience, not just kind of remembering, oh, you know, when those jerks in the lab electrocuted me a few days ago in the maze. The mouse actually was reliving that again. And so that's how MIT scientists were able to prove that engrams form. And this is a very important thing as far as our discussion tonight because it means that if we can learn to do this, if we can establish direct triggers through either some stimuli, including visual stimuli like vigils and symbolism, into a part of our brain in which when we are experiencing a direct energy that we want to be able to call up again and again and again that experience, it is actually possible to do so. There is actually now physical proof that we can actually form those links to memory in our brain and access them through triggers. You know, Morgan, I know you have a lot more research on this, but I want to talk about engrams for a minute because I find that very interesting. Engrams really are what we talk about when we talk about creating sigils for sorcery. Um, we, we do quite a bit of the work on how to sort of self-implant these triggers so that in a moment one can call upon the static practice or the, or working in the iron ring or any of the techniques that we use by trigger. Because without triggers, one has to stand there and sort of form the work each and every time. And the triggers flip a switch. So when I talk to students about about creating triggers, I often suggest they find an extraordinarily emotional moment and and box that and relive it and use that as a trigger um, in a connection, create an actual connection, a mental, mental leap, from that thing that might have happened to them 20 years ago to right now in the static practice or right now in, in directional sorcery or, or working the boxes, whatever it takes, so that they can say, okay, I need to be in this thing, so I'm going to flip this switch, and I'll do this by a, a sour or difficult memory because they seem to have... Um, more juice. They seem to bring us to a place that we can remember standing in with more immediacy than a place that we stood in in joy or extraordinary peace. So this is why we use them. And then in the, uh, on the, the rest of that is that we have to find a way not to make that moment empowered again. So we use very specific sigil strategies to make the moment not so empowered, but the trigger itself, we're actually pulling the juice out of the fruit and just using the juice. And these are pretty high-frequency aspects of working in sorcery, but this is what it is. So this engram thing is very interesting to me because, like you were saying, the mice are not remembering. They're not saying, oh, yeah, that happened then, and now I'm sort of remembering it. They're actually having a physiological reaction that mimics the reaction in that moment of the original exactly. occurrence. Yeah, so when that happens, what happens for us is we are in a brief flash of chaos. You can label it any other way. You can label it as fear or anxiety or whatever you want to label it as. But what it is is the raw energy of chaos for a moment, a split second. And as practitioners in the science of sorcery, we are able to grasp that chaos and pull it to the side of the void and use it. So, you know, the job of this show, as it has been 
since we've restructured it and put the science in, is really to connect those what we what appear to others as miracles when we work them to the world in which we live, the science of sorcery. And this is this is really the subject built for this kind of work. I know I, I stopped you, but um anybody have any thoughts on that? Well like what Morgan was saying about affecting certain areas of the brain. When I was talking about sig- uh, sigils earlier, there were times when I've had people come to me and ask me for help for certain things. Um, say they they want a job or they want something. or I won't go out and do something just to get you something. It, it's That isn't my way. Uh, you're going to work for it. So I've come up with things as far as like sig- uh, sigils go where I will give it to them and say, this is what this means. I want you to sit home and I want you to study it. I want you to look at it for a half an hour or so every day for a week. Then I want you to put it somewhere that you walk by every day, but I don't want you to look at it. Mm-hmm. So you're, and, you're creating and implanting of the image. Right. Mm-hmm. And their subconscious will take over, and it knows it's there. It knows what it means, but they won't be thinking about it consciously. And it makes it easier for people to do things that are difficult. Um, Like, say you wanted to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. That works a lot better than some of the other ways of doing it because you're not thinking about it. I mean, I know it's hard. I smoked for years, and it's one of the hardest things that you can do is to quit. But this, you're doing it because your mind is telling you to do it. And it's a lot easier when your mind is in control than if you let your emotions be in control. So yep. you're saying that um, these, these sort of imprints, if you will, are usable in immediacy, and that when you work with clients, you you are teaching them by the very use of it. Right. Yeah, that's it's the way to go. The, it's improving themselves without them knowing it. It, it. It's like, it's an easier way of me kicking you in the ass and you don't know I'm kicking you in the ass. I would know, though, Chris. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I, I mean. It, I'm no I'm no victor, but I can make a joke now and then. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> No, of course, I know what you mean. And, and I, I do a similar thing with clients. I, when somebody calls me and says to me, listen, I have, I don't know, a stalker. I use that example a lot because a lot of people come with this sort of thing that somebody's bothering them. And I say to them, well, you know, I can I can create the divide or I can teach you to create the divide. And when they say I can teach you to create the divide, when they, when they accept that, that they're going to learn it, it's so much better. The work is more exacting in a way because they are in control of it, and they learn to grow in the process. And you know, ultimately, isn't that what we're here to do? Yes. Morgan, what? I know that I interrupted you in the middle of your discussion of the science of the thing. Can I invite you to come back in? Oh, sure. Yes, and I was uh, going to talk about imprints because there's a, a difference when we're working with any cues but it especially seems to work with visually between imprint and instinct. Now, you know, imprint is a conditioning sort of thing. If you think about Pavlov's dogs, he is, the dogs were trained to drool at the sound of the bell. And that was a conditioned response over a period of time. Uh, Sort of what Chris was saying about giving a person a symbol and telling them what it means. And, that's, you know, how symbolism often works is through association. There has to be a context for the person to understand the symbol. You know, a swastika means one thing to people in Asia where it's associated mm-hmm. with beneficial influences and quite sure. another thing to Jewish people. Uh, I do want to note the swastika faces one direction in Asian iconography and the opposite direction is a Nazi symbol. But if you show a swastika to a Yanomami Indian from South America or someone from the Dogon tribe in Africa, uh, it doesn't matter which way it's facing there, you'll get no response. So one symbol evokes three different reactions, and it's all due to association or lack of association. Mm-hmm. But sigils, though, are, are a special case, in my experience, 
they can work by association as what Chris was saying, you you know, give a person a symbol to work with and tell them what it means so they always have a subconscious reminder. But it can also provoke an instinctual response in a person who sees it. Even if they have no cultural or intellectual context with that sigil, if they're viewed for the first time, they can evoke a feeling in us, a sense that something is there, something we know, but we can't put into words. So, of course, they have to have meaning to the person who constructs the sigil. But the interesting thing about sigils is that they can be used against people or working with people. You can use sigil magic, and the other person doesn't have to know it. With a plain old symbol, if you want it to affect the person, the other person always has to see it. But with a sigil, really only the person who's manipulating it to change circumstances needs to see it and needs to understand it. The people who are being affected, the targets of the work, don't ever have to see it at all. And that's where you kind of go from what science can explain as far as how things work right into where sorcery explains how things work because it's a totally different level and science hasn't quite caught up with the sorcery part of it yet. I have three things to say. What a shock. And the first, aside from thank you, because that's exactly where I want to go in terms of discussing this, the idea that sigils work, whether somebody is um, aware of them or not, is absolutely the fact. That's how it is. They are built in such a way where they, they trigger an energy in in the mind, and if if the theory that we're working on in sorcery, that all thoughts, ideas, and intentions have physical weight, that means there is almost a collective consciousness about that, that particular sigil meaning that particular thing. I mean, if you go as far back as the the Goetic uh, sigils, there are so many people who have looked at them, and I don't want to get into a discussion about the Goetia, but there are so many people who have looked at them that they hold that weight of um, meaningfulness in this way. And... Well, the way that that works is that the human mind looks at it and says, yes, this could mean that in some way, not even on the cognitive level, but in a more, um, I would say, almost ethereal level. Yes, these images bring this up. If you look at two of the sigils that I work with quite a bit, which are um, modern takes on other kinds of imagery. They're, for, they're orig- Iron Ring originals, which means they're my sigil specifically. Two of them come to mind as, as diametrically opposed to one another in shape and form. And one is the, um, the sigil for the bringing in or the allowing in of dark energy. And, of course, we could do another entire show on what dark energy means, but for the purpose of this show, it's the 70% dark matter that we are um, accustomed to existing in, whether we are conscious of that or not. And this is a very sort of austere two circles connected by a bar, and the circles are slightly different. And and it looks, it it has a a symbol almost almost like a, you'd see a dumbbell drawn in in a silent movie, or a dumbbell dumbbell, um, constructed in a silent movie the two circles on the end and the bar in the middle. And there's different things in the circles, but they are very much, um, it, it, when you look at it, it is fairly clear that there is a there are two kinds of energies here in this particular sigil, and we are going to bring the second one that we are less cerebral about into our consciousness. And then you go all the way to the other extreme where you use one of the sigils that I use for um, for changing one's sexual energy, um, to become sexual in a way where the energy from it is pervasive and you can extrapolate the energy from the sexual experience and use it independently. This is a very involved, very um, well-constructed, sort of beautiful entanglement of lines and and various iconography inside of the circle. Now you have one austere sigil and one very involved, very constructed sigil and I will tell you that in the dozens of years that I've been using those sigils in particular and, and collecting the data, there has there has never been anyone who didn't look at them and get a sense at least of what they were for and have a real understanding that we are going in that direction. So to your point, Morgan, there is something about well-constructed sigils, and to your point, Chris, the use of things such as the runes, and, and, and I'm bringing everybody's point in here because it all makes sense, 
And what Victor was saying about um, the sigils that were really talismans that his grandfather brought to him, these these symbols don't don't exist randomly. Somebody isn't scribbling down a few lines and telling everyone what they mean. They come from the human experience, and therefore other human beings experience them in the value of what of what transpired to develop them. I know I've gone on quite a bit about that, but thoughts? Well, I think there is at a certain point, there's a, a part of us as humans that wants to create and also wants to organize and wants to form links. We want to understand what's going on, and if the experience is meaningful to us, uh, we want to be able to repeat it or perhaps suppress it if it was meaningful in a negative way. So for me, creating sigils is a natural expression of that. We're trying to put something that's not necessarily a concrete experience and we're trying to form some kind of concrete link to it, knowing and understanding that it's really our minds, the deeper parts of our minds that are going to be able to reestablish and relive that experience for it, yet we always feel this need to have some kind of touchstone to just put our finger on, whether it's a symbol, whether it's an object that's imbued with some sort of uh, ritual significance. We always want to have something there that we can actually physically manipulate in order to help us make that little bit of a leap to reactivate that part of our brain. I have an interesting story. I had a blind client about a year and a half ago who said to me, I want you to teach me how to work with sigils. Well, it was an interesting conversation. And I said, well, I I know sign language. Of course, that's not useful to you. But I know that sign language for individuals who are experiencing um, vision impairment as well as hearing impairment, the technique, at least in the past, has been to spell words into their hands so they could feel the letters in my hand come into their hand. And they could therefore create the mimicry because mimicry has to come through one of the senses. It just must. If you can't see and you can't hear, then you must feel. So we talked about how to do this. So what I did was instead of trying to create a raised version of the sigils or a descriptive version of the sigils, the way I just described on the radio um, one of the sigils, we felt that this was not the best way to do it. What I did was, over and over, draw the sigils in his hand with my finger. And we we did an interesting experiment over about three months where I said, here's the sigil. And then he would redraw what he thought I wrote in in the way that he, in, he had a device that had a circle and a square, and he would draw inside of them. And... Um, more often than not, he was pretty accurate about what it was that I had drawn in his hand. But, but what's most important was that he was accurate about what he thought the sigils meant. So here we have this complete removal of the visual presentation and yet a very pure delivery of the the bits and pieces, if you will, of the sigil coming through with that kind of clarity. And I thought in that moment that this was a, a new piece of information about sigils and about how powerful the the movement of creating them is and, and going back to what we were just talking about, the human mind created them and therefore the, another human mind can pick them up. And um, I know that I, do, I don't do Reiki, but I know that at least two of you have and I, I know Victor has, knows a lot about Reiki. So I think there's some exchange in the hands in that Methodology, am I correct about that, Victor? Yes. Uh, I, when I first got involved in Reiki as my first uh, healing modality back in the late 80s, um, in the practice of Reiki, uh, you're taught three uh, basic and then one additional symbol. Uh, there's a lot of schools that claim they have additional symbols, but in, in what's known as traditional Usui, Dr. Usui, who was the founder of Reiki uh, system, uh, there are three basic symbols and one additional symbol. And the three basic symbols are, in essence, switches to turn on the flow of energy in certain forms. Um, and when you're taught the original uh, symbols, you're taught first to draw them, and uh, they teach you to draw them in purple. Uh, you're taught then to trace them with your hands, and you're taught to use the names of the symbols. So as you call in 
or bring in each symbol, present each symbol uh, prior to doing the healing work or during the healing work, you draw, visualize, and call in the symbol three times. Now, what's interesting is when you first start the practice, you follow this, um, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it religiously, uh, because this is what you're taught to do. But as you learn and grow in the energy, these things become imprints, they become automatic. So rather than having to draw the symbol, you can visualize it. Um, you're calling in automatically, and, and just by using your intention applied to these symbols, the energy begins to flow, and you feel the energy flowing very strongly. Um, interestingly enough, when I first got involved in this, um, I'm a person who feels things. I'm an empath, and my hands are very sensitive. And I found that moving my hands over the Reiki symbols produced a certain amount of energy, a certain kind of energy, where I could feel the actual shapes of the symbols. I found this also happened in retrospect with, with uh, Hebrew calligraphy, with Hebrew writing, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, certain mm -hmm. Chinese scrolls that I've come across and Japanese scrolls that I've come across, that there's an energy or a power to these symbols or to this calligraphy, to this writing. And uh, I was actually, in the beginning of the show, mentioning my trip to Curacao and a wonderful discovery I had down there. Well, it turns out that the oldest synagogue, Jewish temple, in the Western Hemisphere is in Curacao. It was founded and dedicated in 1732 uh, by Jews who had escaped from the Spanish Inquisition in the 1500s, uh, had immigrated to uh, Holland uh, or into the Netherlands area, and then traveled to the uh, islands, which were the possessions of the colonies of the, of the uh, governments and the, uh, the kingdoms there. And they actually arrived on Curacao in the uh, mid-1600s. The synagogue was dedicated in 1730. And on the second floor of the museum, they have, by the way, it has a sand floor, which blew me away completely. It was built on, it was a beet plant when they originally built it, and it still has the same sand floor. Uh, it's absolutely magnificent. And when you go to the museum on the second floor, they have the original Torah, and for those who don't know the Torah, of the five books of Moses, or the first five books of the Old Testament, the original Torah that was brought with them from Spain that was created in 1350. So I'm standing in front of this scroll, which obviously is behind the glass enclosure, and they, uh, encourage, they tell you absolutely not to take any photographs because that could damage this. It's, it's done on deer skin. And just standing in front of this scroll, and it was open in the center, and you could see the calligraphy in there. I was feeling this energy just jumping off and actually gave me chills. And it reminded me of the discussion we had a couple of shows ago about reliquaries and the amount of energy that people put into, uh, in, in Catholic churches, the remains of saints and blood of saints and so on and so forth. That same type of effect where people have been looking at these things, marveling at these things, and, and just taking whatever the energy was coming from them and putting their energy back in. And there's, an accumul there's a cumulative effect. And by standing in front of that scroll, I felt the cumulative effect of all the people who endured this thing since 1350, and it was absolutely wonderful. The cumulative, uh, cumulative effect is a brilliant, brilliant uh, way to, to put that. I'm fascinated by that story, and I want to talk more about that, and I want to talk about my experience with a, another document like that. But I wanted to just get um, Chris's thoughts on Reiki, because I know that he had done it as well. And I just want to be really clear, I do not do Reiki, and I have never had the experience of it where it felt empowered in any way in my presence. However, I completely respect that others do it and that they have... Um, amazing results with it. Chris, you have some thoughts on Reiki and the exchange of symbols? Going back to the Reiki symbols, I went through the same thing that Victor went through, and you know, I, I'm, <laughs> you know how I am. And you know, it's one of them things I stood there at the end going, now what the fuck am I supposed to do? <laughs> so, I thought, okay, it sounded a whole lot to me when I was doing it, when I was learning it. This sounds like the practice of Norse rune making. They did the same thing. They, they would sit and they would carve the rune out, and while they were doing it, they would chant the rune's name into it and empower the rune and everything like that. And I'm thinking, I don't know these symbols. I don't know, you know, I'm not... Chinese, I'm not Japanese, I'm not Oriental, I can't, this doesn't work in my Eastern European mind, okay? 
So what I did was I incorporated my own rune symbols with with the Reiki tech with the Reiki um, techniques. Mm -hmm. And it works very well. Um, so it, my thing is so much it's not what you put down is what you put into it. Absolutely, I agree. You know, I could put down the word Smith and tell you that it means streetcar, and as long as I kept telling you that, you would eventually read it that way. Mm-hmm. So well, that's, that's what language is. That's what language right. is. It is what they told us it was. And by they, I mean those who utilized the formation of dots, dashes, or whatever, and brought to us a meaning. Um, and that is, that's the human experience to do that. Morgan, you had some thoughts about um, symbols you wanted to jump in? I did. Yes, I did, because uh, it was very uh, it linked to what Chris was saying about uh, taking a symbol that didn't necessarily mean something directly to him and finding a way to incorporate it in a wee way that was meaningful. Uh, my background primarily is with voodoo, and although I've studied a lot of other paths, it's been the one constant in my life. And in voodoo, we have symbols that are known as vedas. Vedas are drawings that represent the energy of particular spirits, which in voodoo is, are called the lua. And the vedas are sometimes drawn on paper nowadays in modern times, but what the ancient practice is and what is still practiced today in most voodoo houses is the Veda is actually drawn on the ground in cornmeal. Uh, sometimes it's on, in white flour, but these are incredibly complex diagrams. And sometimes they have similar symbolism. For example, there are a class of spirits known as the Azilis, and they always have a heart in them, whether it's Azili Frida, Azili Danto, Azili Shafouj, there will always be a heart somewhere in there. But the rest of the symbolism is entirely different for each different spirit. And they're, like I said, they're very incredibly complex. The actual power comes and build as you're drawing the vey vey and you're getting closer and closer and closer to opening the portal to allow that spirit to appear as you draw the vey vey. There are variations between different houses as far as specific spirits. So a vey vey for the spirit known as the Zilli Dantor may look one way in one house. It may look a, a similar but not exactly precisely the same way in a different house. And all the energy that's coming into the babies as they're being uh, drawn in this very complex way by sprinkling cornmeal on the floor in very intricate patterns is coming partially from the people who are there participating because they know what energy they're trying to channel. But it's also coming from the other side. It's reaching out from the other side, and that spirit reaches out until finally the last little piece of the Vede is there, and then that spirit's energy is considered to be fully present. It may or may not take possession of one of the followers at that point, but that spirit for all intents and purposes is there. So when you have that fade, that drawing on the ground, you better not step on it, you better not mess it up, you better not watch what you're doing because if you mess with it in any way, that spirit can become extremely angry and that could be a real problem for everybody involved. Well, isn't the trigger then, um, one of the triggers is the understanding that the veve must stay intact. And and yeah. the respect issue becomes the trigger um, for people's conduct and this sort of thing, but more so for the procedure, the ritual going forward. Yes, it is. And the thing is, once that day day is there, then you can actually treat it as if it is the spirit. Offerings are made... Uh, and placed on the Vey Vey very carefully, of course, because you don't want to destroy it. Libations are mm -hmm. poured around the Vey Vey. And if the spirit chooses not to manifest by taking possession of someone, it, it, you don't still have the same interaction that you would if a full possession took place, but people are still able to come up and interact with that energy and make private requests in a special way. So it, it's one way of contacting the spirits if they choose or for some reason cannot manifest. You know, it's interesting to me that because we're talking about so many different types of symbols, and and symbols really are the base components of sigils. In some cases, they are one and the same. Um, I mentioned earlier um, pictographs and this sort of thing, and you know, even even if you look at the Coptic languages, all of this 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 symbolism, which does not represent sound, 
And I think that's really, aside from the higher elevated understanding of something like the alphabet, there is a, uh, it, the symbols that we use are not necessarily attached to sound. I have a rather, I think, rather unique approach to um, looking at how sigils are constructed and constructing my own because for me, the uh, higher functioning symbols of um, math are very useful. And, you know, sometimes when I say that, I can hear the cringing. But um, for me, the the list of the, the mathematical symbols, the matrix symbols, this kind of thing, are very, very helpful. I can create equations in my head in the way that Tesla talked about. I'm not comparing myself to Tesla. I'm, t- I'm car- comparing my my methods to what I understand his methods were to be. Um, the idea that one works out a solution in their mind by understanding fully what an equation is, and I don't mean just voltage and amps and that kind of an equation, but the probability of how things will work um, on the ground. So the creating of the of the actual working model in te- Tesla's mind was done in Tesla's mind, and he would not create a working um, model of something until it worked in his mind. For me, sigils are the same thing. When I'm building a sigil specifically for an individual or a ritual or something that is not yet in common usage, that has not had years of data even amongst my students and my and, and other people in the work, then what I do is I look at the mathematical situation, and I like to use the word situation. If I add this and this into this individual's existence, what will happen? What will happen is this. And to find the components of that equation that do not afford room for error and other variables is the high art of making individual sigils. If someone says to me they have um, a specific dis-ease and it is my, is my task, I've been called upon to work on the, the removing of that dis-ease from this living human being, then I say, okay, this human being has this thing, which in the common structure of things creates an experience called death or whatever the outcome is over X period of time in the common data of the thing. So in that equation somewhere, I have to find a new variable, a change-up, if you will, and I construct the sigil thusly so that this individual with this dis-ease now experiences, instead of what... The medical community tells them is the next phase, whatever that could be. It's a it's a broad gaze, mattering on what's wrong with them, or, or what's broken, or what's diseased. And I plug in a new variable. So I say, X individual has has Y disease, and in this story, that doesn't happen anymore. Or in this story, there is a reversal back to the period of time prior to the diagnosis of this disease, and therefore that person is not experiencing that anymore. So sigils for me are a mathematical equation. To do that, I involve myself in the understanding of extremely high-functioning um, symbols that are used in all manner of, of um, types and sorts of math to create those exacting equations. Very many of the um, original iron ring sigils that I've created come from that particular perspective. So I was wondering, for example, Victor, you know quite a bit about uh, the the alphabets and that sort of thing, and, and we were talking one day, I think, about Lamed and, and the structure of that. Are there any of them that come to mind that you can dissect for us in that way? Oh, you caught me. <laughs> That's that's. Uh, I'm trying to think of. Uh, well, y- if you're talking about the the original shape and uh, the shape and form and the meaning, for example, the the aleph is considered to be the oxen, but it also has a numerical value. And in gematria, you take the numerical value to find a greater meaning. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, it is. And because people have the people who who work with those letters in their life experience have an understanding, a basic understanding of those components. So therefore, perhaps they don't know that that particular equation, but when they look at the Aleph, they'll say, oh, okay, well, there is a common knowledge of the construction of this. And because the Aleph is is a letter used, as all the letters are, in in important books going back in time, important meaning so much that, that they were revered in some way, 
um, then therefore it carries that common knowledge, that weight, that importance with it. That's exactly what I was asking. Um, Morgan, is there a question in the chat room? There is, and it directly relates to what you were talking about because you mentioned using mathematics to help you construct the sigils and, and using that type of focus. But, of course, that's in one part of the brain. And the other part of the brain where sigils and, in some sense, all symbols work is in the other hemisphere of the brain that uh, controls emotions, controls impulsive thoughts. So Chad had a question for us. Do sigils actually get both hemispheres of the brain working in tandem? Yes, they do, and the reason that I'm sure that they do is because there is often cathartic reactions to the experience of sigils. When somebody is given a sigil, someone says to me, I'm having X problem, and I create a sigil for them, or I provide them with sigils that have been in current usage in my work or, or the work of um, more historical things like um, Nordic Nordic sigils and this sort of thing. When I give them a sigil and they have a profuse cathartic reaction to it, it's hit the emotional side. It is really the emotional side, I feel, that um, is more profoundly triggered by the experience of sigils than the not as emotional side. I'm not sure that I have an acceptance that it's so black and white, left and right. But um, I understand that that is the common thought. So sigils are like going back to what Victor was saying about the stop sign. When you come to a stop sign, yes, your body starts to understand you should hit the brake or you should stand still or you should do whatever you're supposed to do at a stop sign. But the reason that you're stopping, the reason is because something might be coming in another direction that could injure you. That's what it's for. Or that someone is crossing in front of you that you could injure. So there is a human component uh, the, the aspect of danger, the, acts, the aspect of consideration for another individual or for con creating a confusing, chaotic situation moving forward through that stop sign. So all, all symbols that we acknowledge, all symbols that we, response, we respond to, that we participate in on the day-to-day -day level, have both right and left brain components. When I create sigils, I don't make an effort to cross that line from one to the other, I make an effort to draw an equation that results in a solution, and certainly emotions are involved in that solution. Um, that's really the best way that I can answer that is to have looked at the data and the experiences. Anybody Could have I thoughts on that? Yeah, I want to follow up with a quick question. Please. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you ever find that sigils then, we talk about the right and left hemispheres of the brain, but this, of course, is the more developed part of the brain that we have gotten through evolution. Do you work with any sigils or know of any sigils or ways of constructing sigils that would directly influence only the more atavistic parts of our brain, the, the basic instinctual parts that are, can be found long before primates even develop, things that are in our brain stem and in the basic parts of our brain that are also in reptiles and amphibians, can any of the sigils affect these areas of the brain? So you're talking about what, what the common phrase is, the lizard brain. Yes. A lot of people use yeah. the phrase, the lizard brain. Yes, absolutely. Three sets of sigils come to mind. The sigils um, that have been created through the work of the Iron Ring to make the connection to the disincarnate, the sigils that have been created through my work in the Iron Ring to make connections to demons. And the third set of sigils, which I have not really offered as an exacting set, I have shared them with students um, in and out of different lessons and various um, sessions and scenarios, which I call the poisoners. And they're not necessarily just for poisoning, but they are for enacting an experience of um, survivalism, and for hitting the button of, of fight or flight. And they are specifically drawn so that the individual using them has a choice to use them on their own capacity and change their own um, level of willingness to stay in a bad situation and to reenact what we refer to as a lizard brain, reenact, uh, re regenerate, reinvigorate, if you will, those primal instincts. And they can also use these sigils when working with the boxes and reflective sorcery and directional sorcery, sending it outward to hit that nerve, if you will, that primal um, instinct, 
that comes from that part of our brain, the early part, the part before we develop such a large um a, a large human brain, a, such a large cavity of of areas that we now refer to as left brain and right brain. But um these sigils are specifically done for that. Um one I have one student who's asked me to explain those to him and um I actually think that it would be best if we waited till we could do that in person. And I have another student who has a functionality which is different than all of the other students at the moment. He does not need to draw anything. I I show it to him, and he takes it in, and he has it. So we work together in that way. And for him, I think that, you know, the common thought would be that he has, very much like I do, a very developed sense of how to do that cognitively, but that's not really what's happening. It's quite the opposite. We both have a very good connection to our primal instincts, to that quote-unquote lizard brain. So um, I, I could say that there are sigils that I have specifically developed to that effect. Anybody want to jump in? Um, I just wanted to follow up with this concept of left and right hemisphere balancing, and I think that the Hebrew alphabet, the alphabet, the Hebrew calligraphy is a very great example of that. Um, from the right side of the brain, or the left, uh, the left uh, side of the brain and the right side of the body, the logic, uh, each of the Hebrew uh, letters has a number assigned to it. So there's definitely a, a numerical value, which is the logical side or the, the, uh, the left side of the brain, the right side uh, of the body. Uh, from the left side of the body, uh, um, sorry, the uh, left side of the uh, right side of the brain, which is the left side of the body, um, the original Hebrew letters were done as pictographs. So, for example, Aleph, the first letter, which has the numerical value of one, uh, I said ox before, I was in, I'm incorrect, it's the steer head. But it also has the, the message or the image, uh, the concept of the beginning the start of things, the beginning, and it also has the concept of uh, the divine. So within the context of that one letter, you have all of these concepts, and some concepts are left brain, some concepts are right brain, but ultimately they have both. Well, when we draw personal sigils, I think that that comes into play. Um, I have a personal sigil, and many people have seen it. I don't know who else in this group has a personal sigil or who is working on one. But when one works a personal sigil, you bring all of those things into it. There's emotion in it. There is life story in it. My sigil compri- comprises um, a work with chaos. It, works, it involves the number nine, he being my um, primary attending demon of, of all of them. Um, and it, it encompasses a lot of uh, numerology in the sense that the there is a counting of sticks and a weight of where the sticks are and they weigh heavier at the side that I have assigned to the disincarnate because I live my life in service to the disincarnate. So um, the building of one sigil is a tremendously powerful exercise to connect what we refer to as right and left hemispheres, but to connect them with this primal brain as well, because if you are enacting or creating something that is to represent you, this is something that that really must hit the mark, because I don't suggest that one releases a sigil, and by which I mean to uh, by releasing a sigil to present it. I don't mean to a hundred of your closest friends. I mean, when you create it and you accept it as whole, then it is presented. When it's finished, it's presented. So I suggest that one not present their sigil until they're sure, until it absolutely has, at this moment in their life at least, all the requirements, all the components. To work with sigils, one really has to do exercises. You really have to look at symbols. You have to have an understanding of the trigger factor. And you know there are many ways to do this. There are many uh, there are many exercises we, we do. I do exercises with my students in Wednesday night core classes. Almost every single one of them is doing other projects that they've come to me for, and we're working on things. People have you know financial issues, or they have emotional issues, or they have containment issues in which so much as they want to contain something that's that's creating a problem for them in their life, or they want to c- contain a behavior of their own, all, all manner of things. The, there are so many possibilities, too many to list. 
But what I've asked many of them to do is to work with groups of sigils that I provide and then to look them over and come to a place where they could draw something that represents the experience of having gone through what I call a sentence or a story of sigils. Sometimes I'll give someone six or eight sigils and and say, go through each one of these in this way over a period of time. And that period of time, of course, is a variable that changes from one to another. And these sigils sometimes enact or uh, need blood sorcery, and I want to mention that because we haven't really talked about that. And you know, as that is the baseline component of the visceral side of my work, then know that it is very important that some sigils require an enactment of harvesting one's blood and placing it on the sigil. What that does is creates an ownership that is profound. It's not an ownership of the sigil. It's not a copyright. What it is is a, an ownership of the enacting of the energy of the sigil. Something, a statement that you're saying that this is so important that I am providing an enactment of some sort of suffering, some sort of harvesting, some experience that is not necessarily pleasant and participating in the enacting of the sigil in that way. And I think that historically there have been, you know, many, many people who have done this kind of thing, maybe not labeling it blood sorcery in the way that I do, but, you know, to Chris's point, the carving of sigils over and over and over again sometimes involve the carving of them in their own flesh. Isn't that so, Chris? Yeah. And as far as the blood goes, going back to your original talking about the reptilian part of the brain, I would think, you know, I'm not a scientist, but the whole idea of the pain and the side of blood, which, you know, we all talked about before, about that being something that that is very visceral to people, is to see you, your own self, bleed, and the power Mm -hmm. behind that, that I think that that would almost bring anything that you would do and set that into that part of your brain. Where, where your survival instincts are. You know, it, it's almost to the point that you, when you cut yourself and you put some of you on whatever it is, it, that's going to leave a mark. I mean, somewhere in your mind, that's going to leave a mark. And I would mm-hmm. imagine that it would be in the part that you don't usually think with. I mean, we don't think so much with that as we act with it. You know, we don't think about running when somebody's coming after you. I mean, you you see a bear running up the street. You don't stand there and go, what the hell am I going to do next? You know, it, it's an automatic inclination to run. And I think that's the same thing with some of these sigils. When you anoint them with blood, just the, just the idea of you doing that is enough to sink it that deep into your head that it will stick with you. Well, you know what, Chris, I'd like to go out on a limb here and say that the discussion of blood sorcery is something that we have not done enough of on the radio, no. and, and I would like to do that next week if if everybody else is interested. Morgan? That sounds good to me. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Good, good, because this is something that follows up sigils in a sense. You know, sigils are, are what they are, and they create triggers, but to Chris's point that the enacting of of the interruption of the skin, the breaking of the vessel, is a statement well past that which um, which we can address in this short time. I'd like to do a show on it. And thank you for that, Chris. Um, yeah, let's do that next week. Victor, um, did you have a question? I know that you had said yes. we're, we're chatting with each other also online, so go ahead. Yeah, in in, in the, uh, in, the in this discussion that we've been having, it, it came to me uh, that uh, the practice of I Ching, which is the casting of sticks in forms of hexagrams to uh, for the purpose of divination, uh, we, we talk about intentional sigil creation. This is sort of an unintentional sigil creation, but is it in fact creating a sigil? With the are the hexagram sigils? Yeah, I'd like to weigh in on that real quick, Victor, because if we take it back to where the I Ching actually came from, what they would do before they cast the sticks or before they, um, and later on through coins to determine the hexagrams, they would take either a shoulder bone of an animal or sometimes a tortoise shell and cover it in ink 
and then they would throw that into a fire. And based on the cracks that formed as the ink dried and the cracks that formed along the bone, sometimes the bone itself was cracking as well, they would interpret those patterns. So in both cases, I think that what you've got going on is a matter of the energy of the moment actually creating the sigil for you, rather than a person trying to channel the energy and draw a sigil or decide what kind of energy they want to channel and then sitting down and figuring out how to put it onto paper. This is a case of the energy itself actually manifesting and showing you what's going on. So yeah, that's a sigil, but in that case, I think it's energy speaking to us rather than us trying to control the energy. Well, paper is new and it's a luxury. And, And if you think about the fact that paper is new and it's a luxury, then, um, you know, to expand on your point, the idea that one uses what we use now to create sigils versus what historically was used, um, it's it seems like a, uh, in some ways, and not not to not to put it down in any way, but it seems like it pale, pales in comparison. Um, the idea that that one can just grab a pen and draw on a piece of paper that comes out of a notebook is really a tremendous and extraordinarily modern luxury. I mean, I know we've we've talked about the Aleph Bets a lot tonight, but I know people who who, um, hand-write Torahs, and um, these are men who spend countless hours in little rooms with quill feathers that they've cut, and that they're reshaping as they go along using a special ink and and going letter for letter and you know they they can't hit the back button they make an error Absolutely. and and that page is you know I'm sure you could tell you could speak on this Victor yeah the the it's the concept of what's known as the kosher Torah and for uh-huh. for the Torah to be kosher it has to be done exactly the way the scribes have been doing it for thousands of years. It has to be written with that specific ink. It has to be written with a specific scroll. It has to be done on certain lines, and the letters have to be exactly the same way. And it's almost like a human Xerox machine. Uh, the, the word machine is, is really inappropriate here, but it must be done according to the, the ancient art of Torah scroll writing and in order for it to be an accepted what they call kosher Torah. You know, it's similar to um, the book of Going Forth by Day, which most people know as the Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and, and the coffin texts. The coffin texts are a um, another version of that which was written inside of coffins, instructing the disincarnate what to, about what to do in the afterlife. The Book of the Dead, per se, is a collective it wasn't called the Book of the Dead. They didn't write a Book of the Dead and give it to the next disincarnate or the next person who's died and stick it in, in with their burial. It didn't work that way. These things were written on linens. They were written on statues. They were, these these were spells per se to um, help the newly dead individual navigate the afterlife or the or the underworld. Mattering on which period of time you were talking about, those words were interchangeable in some ways. Um, so these these what were really elaborate pictographs were spell instructions about navigation, and when we talk about sigils, and I talk about simpler sigils, or Chris can share with us his expertise in, in runic symbology, um, we are talking about a very um, narrow, in some ways almost simplified, and and by simplified I. I ask not to hang on that, the common usage of the word, which means to dumb down, but that by simplified, I mean to to make pure, to find the the single essence that is valuable in the bigger story and to present it in a circle and to be able to create it in such a way where it is a trigger to the human mind. This is a a really, really high-functioning skill to be able to do so, but it comes from... It comes from you know thousands of years of our predecessors doing the long hand, if you will. And so, sir, to your point, that scroll that I saw in Curacao from 1350 was written on deerskin. Yeah. yeah, there you go. And and here it is, so many hundreds of years later. 
And what you said about them not wanting people to take photos of it because it could be damaged, I mean, this is something most people don't even think about, the process of light hitting these kinds of things and, and how they're affected and how they're, they could be bleached out and damaged by light. And, and also there is a certain, um, I guess, protective sentimentality, and, and you can all read between the lines there, um, about not necessarily taking these images and, you know, running off and showing them to everybody on your iPhone. Because That's they right. have, yeah, they, ha- they have an importance just in the way they are. I mean, I, I had the privilege to go to the exhibit um, to see Da Vinci's notebooks. And I was startled. I was just startled. You know, we think of notebooks as something lined or something in which we are um, creating specific notes and we are, you know, sitting in class, but that's not that's not what these were. These were pages upon pages of his moment of of inspiration, his thoughts, his curmudgeons, his his experience. I was watching a documentary when I when I looked at that. It was powerful, powerful stuff. And there were signs everywhere. There will be no photographing. It didn't say please don't. It says there will be no photographing of the pages of the notebooks. And it occurred to me in that moment that they were talking about the power of the thing. And here we were in this sterile Smithsonian kind of environment, and they were still clearly um, enamored by and in respect of the power of the thing. And we're talking about creating sigils. These were enormous statements. These are, are physically powerful things just to just to gaze upon. And isn't it well, huge that kind of part of it is taking an image of something, you're also stealing part of its image, its energy in a way. You're, you're, you're yes. diminishing yes. it. Mm-hmm. Yes, Chris, I I'm agree. sorry I interrupted you. <laughs> That's fine. I, I was just going to say that that goes back to what we were saying about empowering something. Uh, you just break it down into its basics. It's words on a piece of paper. That, that's what it is. You know, where does the energy come from in those words that are on that piece of paper? Why is it so important that we have to save this stuff? Now, why is it so important that you can't take a picture of it? Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with the with the item itself. It's what is empowered into that item. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, we make it what it is. It it didn't come that way. You know, uh, he he could have a, a picture on there of his grandmother, and it wouldn't mean anything to us per se, except for the fact that they put Leonardo da Vinci underneath it, and that now that means something. Well, you look at something like the Nag Hammadi scrolls, which which could prove or disprove what is common thought for long periods of time, and and there is an ongoing effort to take a tiny drop of the written material and carbon date it. In a, for a particular section of the scrolls, and people are just you know walking in circles, wringing their hands, and just stressing enormously over if we do it, what do we take from it? Do we destroy it further? And here we have a crumbling scroll that, to the the naked eye, would look like some kind of junk junk found in the desert, and. It's so powerful because of the information that it may or may not hold, and and there are pieces of it that have never actually been unfolded because it'll it'll break so much, and they don't want to create further damage. But we're talking about taking a few molecules, if you will, of a of a letter of a piece of a piece of a letter written in some kind of ink or blood. They're not even always sure. It's it's written in different forms. And to use these materials to look under a microscope, but they don't want to take a piece of it away. Now, of course, I could photograph it a thousand times and have an exacting image that could be represented in just by an, a powerfully well-done photograph, a strong, clear photograph, but that's not enough. They don't want to take those few molecules away. I mean, what is that? That's that's powerful stuff. But you also got to Same think of what that implies, too, because if they take those molecules and they find out that either way it's a bunch of bullshit, that's going to tumble everything. I mean, we're well, not talking about just a little bit of, 
you know, controversy here. This is going to take everything and put it down on its knees. But, you know, the thing about that, and I know that Victor wants to follow up, but let me just jump in. The thing about that is when you disprove something that may or may not be mythological and may be accepted by millions of people, the people who really believe in that thing will not care what that scroll says. And that is the power of of the uh, the perception, the dedication people have to their belief system. But that that being said, it still will be as controversy as much co- as controversial to those people as well, because they will they will see this as some sort of attempted interruption of their truth. Victor, you wanted to say something. I was going to say the same situation applies with the Shroud of Turin. This is an yes, object that's been does. studied, <laughs> that's been sampled and analyzed and controversial, and those who believe will continue to believe no matter what. And and science is still up in the air as to its authenticity. Mm-hmm. And but the people, the people, the scientists who feel that it is a a modern piece, three or four hundred years old. Some people feel that. Um, they can stand on their head and shout their science all they want, um, but people who decide that that is what it, what they want it to be, it doesn't matter. They'll see the science as flawed. They'll see the science as evil. They'll see the science as whatever it is. But if you look at it, it's just a shroud, and it just has an image on it. If you can separate yourself from the emotional presence in it, and if you look at sigils and you look at the, the ones that are that have been known for a long period of time. I mean, you can see people, like I mentioned before, who are who are interested in the Goetia. Those symbols for those demons have been drawn, redrawn, memorized, and lived with for so many years that you would think by now someone could have verifiable proof that they could create that demon or invoke that demon. And it doesn't matter if they can or they cannot. The power of believing in it is what's so strong. Modern sigils, sigils of the Iron Ring sigils, sigils of the Galdebrek, these kinds of things, the power in them is it, they, it is irrelevant what you believe. Going back to what Morgan said on almost an hour and a half ago, it is irrelevant what is believed. What, it, what, the, what is relevant is that an individual who knows nothing about that sigil looks at it and has the same reaction or has the same change of experience that a thousand other people have had. And, and I think that that is really what brings us back to the science of the thing. Thoughts? Well, I Anybody? have to agree. I'm, uh, I said I have to agree with that. Um, as far as the Guisha, I think that... Uh, how do I get into this without taking the rest of the show? Um Oh, go ahead. Take the rest of the show. We're we're, we're ending early tonight. Uh, Take no, five no, no. minutes. <laughs> I have used one of them, and it. I can't say it's a hundred percent. I mean, because it's one of them things where uh, you you get caught up in the moment, and did you really see what you thought you saw? Mm-hmm. But um, I did have a ritual with one of them, and it did work. Mm-hmm. But like I said, it's knowing 100% if that's what it was. I got out of it what I wanted to. That's all that mattered to me. It could have been anything, but I got what I wanted out of it. Well, this they are so they are so powerful, not because they represent specific demons. I mean, that's a separate story. But they are so powerful because for many, many, many years, many, many people have have participated with them. And, you know, we've had discussions about demons. That's what demons want. They want to become tangible. So they, I have a thought that many of them have become tangible, and this is why people are having issues trying to um, enact rituals where these demons actually show up. I feel many of them have gone into tangibility, and not necessarily as human beings. That's a, that's a topic for another show. But um, that they are extraordinarily evolved. But the thing is that you can't you you can't say these kinds of things without getting an enormous amount of emotional feedback from individuals who participate with those demons on a regular basis. I mean there's no difference between the emotional feedback that we get from people who have these kinds of connections and the emotional feedback that people get when they conflict with an idea about one's religion. 
these are powerful emotional patterns. And to go all the way back to Chad's question, which was about right, late, right brain, left brain, and emotions and all that sort of thing, here we are an hour later realizing that it is impossible. Not only is it probable to cross that line from right to left and left to right, but it is impossible to create effective sigils that don't have that component. That's the nature of the work. And and also to the point of using and getting a reaction from something based on using these sigils, I think it's entirely possible that other entities have hooked onto this and said, well, hey, mm-hmm. I, I get this vibration. And so, yeah, this originally was the demon Visago or the demon Flores or the demon uh-huh. Dile. And maybe, but now some other smart entity has said, well, gee, I can tap into that and I can pretend to be this entity. You know, that's. I'm so glad you brought that up, Morgan, because as you know, in 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 our Wednesday night core classes in August, I'm going through a number of the demons in the book that I wrote called 26 Demons Revisited. And what I'm doing is revisiting, revisiting. I'm sharing with the students in the core group what has happened, what's transpired since that book was was um, published, and and talking about how these demons have grown in that period of time or if they've grown at all and therefore one of the things that I'm doing is connecting these demons not to just their own sigil but to other sigils in the practice of of the science of sorcery and um, helping students understand that not just the symbol that represents the demon is the only option, that you can therefore connect this demon to other sigils and hit new triggers. So what you're doing is invoking this this demon, having this recognition, having this connection, and then throwing in the mix other sigils that will create triggers in you that will enhance the experience or enhance the connection or greater or create a greater bond or a broader gaze or more outcome from each and every interaction that you're having with demons. Sigils are powerful stuff. The the thing the 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 ancient grimoires that provide sigils that represent the demons do just that. I'm taking the work one step further, which is to take the sigil that represents the demon and to use that as just the introduction. The hello, how are you? Here's your calling card. Could you come and talk to me? And then take it well beyond that to a place where there is interaction between the practitioner and the demon, utilizing other sigils, utilizing the sigil process, and to enter each other and participate in a profound level with a greater outcome. I don't know that that anyone's doing that, but I'm doing that now with the students, and and people are having enormous experiences and enormous um, success communicating with these demons. Anybody want to talk about that? I know we only have a few minutes and and maybe another four or five minutes before we we go out as we are going out early this evening. Uh, I actually would like to ask a question. As as a novice in in terms of, of blood sorcery and sorcery, um, but in the uh, concept of using blood, you would talk briefly about using blood and sigils and how the amplification uh, that it creates in terms of the sigil. Um, I think back to times when, when people would do business contracts and actually sign them in blood and how the value that was given to that contract, the importance because of the use of their blood in signing these contracts, um, I'm trying to think where I'm going with this now because it just came up in my head. Um, is there is there a greater? Obviously, there's a greater power in in using blood in these in these instances. Um, you know what? I'm t- I'm totally lost, and I'm sorry. I'm really exhausted. Well, I, I kind of feel a question in there. If I can if I can guess an answer. Please, 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 please. <laughs> There are two things that happen when you use your own blood in a contract, when you use it in a sigil, and a sigil is a contract with the experience in the moment. Two things are happening. First of all, you are breaking the vessel. You are injuring yourself to harvest that blood. You are making an agreement that a moment of pain will occur, a moment of chaos. You are interrupting the normal flow of things, and you are causing yourself discomfort. You know that to, the only way to get the blood out, menstrual blood aside, is to impact yourself in some kind of physical way where suffering will occur, even if it's just a tiny bit of suffering, even if it's just a poke in the finger. Suffering will occur. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the human 
brain, the primitive brain, knows that every time you lose a drop of blood, you are not as alive. It takes time for that blood to be uh, recreated. When you lose a great deal of blood, you are, in many cases, not likely to remain alive. So the loss of blood is an attachment to one's mortality. So if I'm signing something in blood, I've taken out enough blood to create an image. I am therefore that many cells closer to death in that moment. Now, not everyone will intellectualize it in that way. However, everybody knows it. When you see blood, when someone's cut, when someone is other than you is cut or you're cut yourself, there is an immediacy of chaos and panic, even at the tiny level. If one gets a paper cut, The sting of the paper cut causes chaos. And then the appearance of blood is startling. That is the way it is in the human condition. It will always be that way. Whether it is an evisceration and blood everywhere and a a, a chaos you can barely imagine or it's a paper cut. The human experience means we stop and we respond because there is an aspect of death in that exp- in the in the experience of cutting ourselves or injuring ourselves in some way. So and and more about that next week, but I think that's the question that you're asking, Victor, and I'd like to start with that next week. Yes, what do exactly. You think? And and in essence what I take from that is when you're signing a contract of any kind in blood, um in essence what you are doing is you're dying to this you're dying to create this agreement in a small yeah. way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Which it makes it ultimate. which makes it so much more valid than just simply signing something with ink. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Absolutely. And, and next week I want to talk about what it means to have the other person's blood on that contract. When we do that, we exchange blood. And let's remember to talk about that. Um, and thank you for that because it's a, pu- a beautiful way out and a beautiful way to, to set up next week. Because blood sorcery, as you can tell by the energy that I'm putting into these comments, is where it is for me. So... On that note, it's it's 10.25, and I want to thank everybody for being willing at this moment to actually end the show early based on what it is that I have to do tonight. When one is in service to the disincarnate, my emergency room is always open. And um, something that I have to do tonight involves just that. So um, I would like to thank the listening audience. I'd like to encourage people to share this um, the podcast with others so that people can hear about the work. Um, there will be a few sigil books coming out very soon. They were supposed to come out over the summer, but you know how it goes. They'll come out in September um, to follow up on this conversation. I will present three sigil books, three groups of sigils, 23, 25, and 27 sigils, and they are based on their their weight and their capacity to move energy, not in specific subject matters. I want to thank this group. And um, I want to say thank you to my co-host, Chris Rogostrowski, who long ago agreed to jump in on this thing with me, Um, to Morgan St. Knight, who is a magnificent producer and writer, and to Victor the Voice Furman. Go ahead, do a round, tell everybody how you can be reached. Um, Victor, you want to start, and I'll end it up? Yes, I can be reached on Facebook. My page is Victor the Voice Furman. And that's with an H. That's with an H, F-U-H-R-M-A-1-N. Thank you. Morgan? Thank you. Yeah. You can reach me uh, at morgansaynight at hotmail.com. Morgan St. Knight is all one word, no period after the saint. And you can also visit me on my webpage, talesofmedia.com. Chris? And you can get me at hellsrogue, H-E-L-S, at gmail.com and on my Facebook page, Hell's Rogue. That's with an apostrophe before the S. I just want to say thank you again for this great team. We're really connecting the science of sorcery to the uh, more emotional versions of of the work, and we have really created a team here.